let me start off by just trying to give a sense of the, the chaos that is Indonesia and why uh, being a reporter there is such a fabulous but exhausting job. I left there two and a half weeks ago and I remember one of the last things I did was have dinner with some journalists I'd spent a lot of time with uh, from the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Singaporean papers and they were all complaining because life had become so boring. Yeah. It, was, it was as though there was a big deflation after the election and we'd all been running so fast for about four or five months trying to keep up with events. And I think the adrenaline you know, had gotten so high that we'd almost become addicted to it. And then of course there was the election, there were a few things that happened after it. But for a journalist it was a bit of a, oh, okay, well that was that and you know, it's not so exciting anymore and maybe there's another country we could go to or maybe there's something else we could do. So that was quite um, funny, especially as I was leaving. So, uh, you know, I was like, oh, I'm glad to be out of here if there's nothing interesting going on. But of course, Indonesia is never straightforward. It's never clear and you can never expect things to happen that the way uh, they, you might think they would pan out. And in the two and a half weeks since I have left, uh, we have of course seen some major challenges to the country's democracy, mm -hmm. which have you know, brought people out and created all kinds of questions about the future of Indonesia. There are already questions about it, but this has put them more on the edge now. So uh, I have actually, while I've been trying to settle back into Melbourne and my job, I've actually been trying to keep up with events. And I feel like I'm back in Jakarta, actually. <laughs> my head's uh, spinning a bit, but I will try from my conversations and give you some idea of what's happening there. Uh, and then also what that might mean for the future. And uh, I think the, the main point is that people really just don't know yet. You know, there are so many possibilities coming out of the current scenario. But I'll try and make sense of uh, some of the ideas that, that are coming up, uh, which change every day, but anyway. If I can give you some uh, historical perspective, I know that you're, you're keen observers of Indonesia, but perhaps if I can give a, a little bit of background. We, of course, had two elections this year. The legislative elections where uh, huge numbers of people were voted to parliament and provincial seats and uh, right down at very local level we had people being voted in. 500,000 polling stations across the archipelago so it was a massive undertaking. We then of course that uh, those legislative elections in uh, April were the lead up to the presidential election in June. So we got a sense then of the sort of logistics involved and some of the issues that might come up but then the presidential election kicked in and I have to say for a journalist it was just an amazing thing to cover I, I think we all agree we were just pinching ourselves <coughs> that we, we were there and we had such incredible access to the main players something that you I don't think you would get in Australia in terms of uh, you know you can get close to the people running for the top jobs but uh, the way you could get close or you could just turn up um, or you could just be part of something chaotic um, and really get a sense of how people felt and what was going on and what was going on in the campaign. So we all felt uh, privileged to be there covering this election which galvanised voters in a way which apparently it hasn't done before. Um, it was, now I, I'd only been there for years so I don't have any personal historical experience but from what we could tell, you know, this was seen as a turning point for Indonesia's democracy. It was the direct, uh, SBY, Susila Bambang Yudhiyono was the president. He was the first to be directly elected. He was now handing over to the next president who would be directly elected. And this was a moment for Indonesia's democracy. Not only that, you had two candidates who could not have been more different. Mm -hmm. Two characters in the story. And to, to see how this played out uh, over just a couple of months was amazing and the way people were, were standing back, they weren't sure which way they would go and then they jumped on and it became one of the most bitterly contested elections 
uh, in Indonesia's short democratic history. You would, of course, know about Prabowo Subianto, the former general, the uh, former son-in-law of uh, Suharto, uh, a man with a dubious human rights record, which came up regularly in the campaign, and he answered questions about that. A man who is part of the political elite of Jakarta, who'd spent a decade preparing to be president of Indonesia. He uh, saw that as uh, his, that was his job, that was his role, that, that's what he was there to do. And he was going to work very, very hard to get that position. And then you had Joko Widodo, who really just did come up uh, out of nowhere in a short space of time. And, and this is seen as a testament to the democracy of Indonesia that this could actually occur. And I don't think people believed it could happen so quickly. Here is a man from an impoverished background, a businessman, man of the people who had no connections to the Jakarta elite or to the party machines, who became mayor of Solo, which is uh, one of the larger cities, uh, captured people's attention with what he was able to achieve there. Then when I was in Jakarta, he became mayor of Jakarta. And I remember the buzz at the time, uh, especially from the younger generations, they were so excited that someone like him could get in. He was humble, he was very down to earth, he'd go and speak to the people, but most importantly, they saw him as someone who would actually get things done. You know, and there were, there were campaigns uh, from, social media campaigns from young people about how they were sick of standing in line, they were sick of the corruption, they were sick of this wonderful country that they lived in not being able to move ahead. And to them, Joko Widodo represented a chance to move the, the, the city of Jakarta ahead and put it on the world stage. So he got in and he was mayor of Jakarta and we were fortunate enough to do one of the first interviews with him. Uh, then the question simply became, uh, the momentum built, would he become the next president? <coughs> and uh, it, it just kept growing and growing, but it wasn't until a few months out from the official campaign that his name was actually properly put forward. So until that time, Prabowo Subianto was building his campaign very strongly. They had a very sophisticated campaign. They put a lot of money towards it. Uh, you know, they, they actually made a lot of effort to make a political mark and then Joko Widodo pops up. Not so much out of the blue, but certainly they weren't expecting mm. that. I don't think anyone was really expecting it. But such, uh, from you know, certainly uh, a large section of the country, such was the need, they were looking for something new, that that's what propelled him forward. You know, many thought it was too early, but there was just this desire to break away from the politics of the past. So you've got these two incredibly different candidates. Prabowo Subianto is very good at speaking, very charming, uh, and Joko Widodo, who for a television journalist is a nightmare because you, you cannot get more than four or five words out of him. Uh, but wherever he goes was followed by a throng of people. We were caught up in one of his crushes. It was, he was like a rock star. Prabowo Subianto was more, he was the majestic one. He was the one who rode the white, the white horse. Um, he'd sort of walk up and down in his semi-military style clothing. He'd have people running around after him. So even that contrast in styles, you know, a man who wore a check shirt to show that he was one of the people compared to the semi-military outfit. So it, 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 it eventually polarized the voters. And the debate became very passionate because they realised something was really at stake here. Was the country going to go to the system, an old system that it had had for so long, or was it going to break away and try something new? And the, the debates within families, the debates on social media, um, the, the rancor, the robustness was uh, something that I understand had never been seen in Indonesia before. And I think it's probably worth pointing out at this point too, that social media plays a huge part in the daily lives of Indonesians, particularly young Indonesians. Uh, one of the largest demographics, uh, 25 and under, they use Twitter and Facebook, for example, to communicate and YouTube. And that's how they got the message across. And that's what they would, you know, they're on their, their chat applications talking to each other. They're a, my producer 
who's a young Indonesian, was talking to our driver. Every day they have a debate about who they were going to vote for. So the election also engaged them, you know, and it made them think that they had a stake. They had had 10 years of Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono and he turned out to be a disappointment. He didn't deliver what they had hoped. And now here was something new and, and two very different choices to make. So we got through that. Uh, and then, of course, we had the, the official count. It was clear uh, as, as the count wound down, I was at the counting centre that Joko Widodo was going to win. Prabowo Subianto made a speech, told his uh, scrutineers to walk out of the counting room. You know, I was sitting there eating a sandwich. I was ta tagging with my producer. We'd, we'd secure a spot in the, in the boat centre. So we, we were tagging each other. So I'd said, I've got to go back and make some phone calls because you couldn't get out on the phone. The lines were just constantly jammed. And I'll grab a sandwich and then we'll swap over. And I was watching TV and Prabowo Subianto said something like, I'm withdrawing from this process. You know, it is. Uh, I, I don't trust it, there is fraud. And I was just on the phone going, okay, I think you should put your camera on the Provoo team scrutineers now. You know, so. <laughs> and they walk out, smiling, of course, because it's Indonesia, and shaking everyone's hand. Um, so I think that was the first indication, uh, the first, perhaps, the, not the first hint, um, an indication that we knew Prabowo Subianto would fight, but I don't think anyone really realised how much he would fight. And that, that was perhaps an indication that we didn't realise what might happen next. He withdrew the scrutineers, that didn't affect the result, but uh, all through leading up to like the last two or three weeks into the final result, he was claiming massive electoral fraud. And that message kept coming out, kept coming out. And then on the day he said, yeah, we have got the evidence and we're going to take it to the Constitutional Court. So then we went through that process where it went to the Constitutional Court. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not like in Australia where the result is known and everyone accepts it and the, the loser congratulates the winner. It just kept getting murkier and murkier. No one came out on the street to celebrate. Everyone was actually very, very careful not to antagonise any feelings. Which, which, which I think was actually really interesting and perhaps not explored enough. And it had a lot to do with undercurrents of fear that, it, that it came up from the late 1990s. You know, people were still worried about if things get out of control, <coughs> if passions get inflamed, if people feel their wrong has been done. So comment to the Constitutional Court uh, was thrown out and then, you know, little things have been happening where they're trying to frustrate the process. The Prabowo Subianto has actually got a coalition of parties that has more seats in the House of Representatives uh, type legislature. So he has power there. So little things were happening there. But as I said, you know, I think everyone was sort of a bit over reporting on it. And it was basically now Joko Widodo is preparing to become president. He's got transition teams in place. He's assembled a huge number of professionals and uh, academics and people to look at changes about how the programs that he wants put in place can be implemented, working with the government, looking at the budget, et cetera, et cetera. So it was sort of a process was taking place, even though uh, you know, it was still disliked by some, it was just this process was going through. And then of course I come home and everything changes. I didn't mean it that way. Um, <laughs> We all thought it was, it was going to be straightforward to October 20 when he became the president. So what's happened? Uh, just before I left, I did go to a panel where we discussed this uh, challenge that was being made to direct elections in regional areas. Now, that may not seem like much, but if you think about how big Indonesia is and how many people it has and how many regional leaders are elected and who has power over regional legislations, uh, legislature, sorry, it can mean you can shift power. And you're shifting it away from the people and their right to directly vote for their mayor, for instance, and into the hands of the party that controls the local legislature. So this was being proposed, and when I left, no one thought it would 
it was it was give thought of maybe a 50 50 percent chance of getting through they were worried about it but um they weren't that they were concerned but they didn't they thought it would might that might just go away and it didn't a parliament that was in its final days of sitting its 11th hour of sitting where half the members you know had, hadn't what rewon their posts or their seats passed this legislation which took away direct elections in regional areas. And I think that really jolted everyone. They, they just couldn't believe that something like that would happen in a democracy that had been moving ahead so well that you would go back to what many have described as a Suharto era style of government. Now, once the shock wore off, you then saw something else happen in Indonesia, which really, uh, I think, will be a feature of the politics here for a while and which will also uh, play out in the months ahead. The party of Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, the Democrats, the president was out of the country. The Democrats walked out of that vote. They didn't vote. But because they didn't vote against it, or they, that meant that the legislation went through. Um, the next day, when people were working out what had happened, on Twitter, a hashtag popped up. Shame on you, SBY. Mm -hmm. That became the top trending Twitter hashtag in the world. Because the people felt passionately, but that's how they communicated. And that's this is how civil society in Indonesia says, we're not happy. This is not good enough. We are not going to accept this. For some reason, that tag couldn't be used after a day or two. Um, questions were asked of the communications minister. So they just invented another hashtag, shamed by SBY. <laughs> and that got traction as well. Um, the president came back to the country and he passed uh, two statutes, I think you would call them, saying, no, 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 you, we can't do this. <coughs> Uh, I'm putting these statutes in place and then the lower house of parliament, their 500 plus seats, they have to agree to it or reject it. And then I was talking to a constitutional law expert today and he thinks and then whatever the house decides, if they want to try and do that again, then the house will have to put up another uh, piece of regulation saying no direct election. So it's messy, 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 as is Indonesia's want. So there are these things going on, but it has raised a lot of concern about how Prabowo Subianto and his Coalisi Meraputi, the coalition of red and white, which is what he's called his political gathering, is using its power to try and change the system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been called uh, aggressive moves, brazen moves, trying to move power back to the elite of Jakarta. Mm -hmm. That's how it's being viewed. So lots of questions there. You've also seen this, uh, the, the majority coalition uh, pick up important positions such as the Speaker of the House. Now they actually use their numbers to, if I'm correct, change the law so that instead of the majority party having the House Speaker position, which would have been Joko Widodo's party, it was now down to a majority vote. So who has the majority and who voted their person in? So they've got the House Speaker position for deputies, if I'm correct. They were trying to snatch the what we would call the upper house. Now I'm getting mixed signals about whether or not that was successful, uh, but, but that's something else they're trying to do. And then, of course, if you have, I'm, I'm sorry if this is getting complicated, but you can see what I had to deal with every day. If you control the house, you may not have the presidency, but if you control the house, you all have also have something called House Committees, and they cover things like finance, defence, um, budgeting. All those uh, committees decide where the money goes, basically. And if you're the head of that committee, you can actually have a lot of power. So how do you get voted in? You're with the party that has the, the majority coalition. I think that's all correct. Um, I apologise if it's not. So th this is where the concern is coming from. This coalition has some strength and it's using it. Now, <laughs> the question is, can Joko Widodo rule in a minority government? 
And I was, uh, I spoke to a, a friend the other day who's the uh, senior newspaper man, and he actually ended up writing, he wrote an article saying, yes, he can, of course he can. There are minority governments everywhere in democracies. And they point to the fact, well, the argument is made that Joko Widodo, in fact, has operated in a minority government the whole time he's held positions of authority. And he's been quite sanguine about it himself. Uh, yeah, I do this all the time. I deal with parliaments that are against me. You know, I, I can manage this. This isn't a, a big issue. I would expect behind the scenes there are lots of conversations going on uh, with members of that opposition coalition. <laughs> So the question is, over the next few months, will Joko Widodo and his team manage to pull away some of those coalition members from the Prabowo Sobianto team, so to speak? And if he's successful, you know, what does that mean he will have to do? Will he have to provide some ministries, for instance, in his cabinet? Uh, will he have to compromise a little bit? He said he wouldn't play games with politics, but you know, maybe he will have to now provide some concessions to get a bit more power, uh, to make sure that his agenda gets through. Uh, it, it depends if the House accepts or rejects the President's statues around the direct elections. Uh, and there are already numerous things going on. I see that one party, the PPP, is talking about moving its support from the Prabowo, so the anti-coalition, to John Woodward's coalition. So it's very fluid. I'm also getting very mixed messages about will this or won't this work? Will Joko Widodo get a chance to actually implement his reforms? Will he be able to manage things, manage the politics, to implement the reforms he wants to? Or is Indonesian democracy in a dire state and it's going to be a disruptive, difficult parliament for five years? And I have spoken to some people who are incredibly pessimistic and can see very difficult, bad outcomes for the country. And I've spoken to others who are like, just watch and wait and see, it'll be fine. These people know what they're doing. Uh, politics in Indonesia is always messy. This is nothing new. So I guess we may not know until you know, a few months. It might start to unfold. It could, someone said, happen as quickly within a month. You know, They could start running away back to, I mean, he is the president. At the end of the day, he's the president. So they might decide to go with the president. You also have in the coalition of Prabowo Subianto the Golkar Party, the traditional party of Indonesian politics, headed at the moment by a business, well, he's not, he says he's not a businessman now, by well known, uh, well known political establishment member, Abarizal Bakri, of the Bakri family. Now, that Golkar party has its convention early next year, and a lot of people are trying to get rid of Aboriginal Bakri. Uh, many of them are angry because Golkar's never been in opposition before, and now it's finding itself in opposition. And I, my understanding is that there are many people who aren't happy about that. Uh, the move against Aboriginal Bakri has been going on for probably a bit more than a year. The question is, you know, what will happen at the convention early next year? Or Yusuf Kala, who is the vice president elect, is part of Golkar, or was, and there is a thought that his influence will come into play at some point, and you know that will change the coalition as well. But it's, it's just unknown at this point. So, dear Indonesia, never straightforward. The story never actually starts, never actually ends. There are just permutations of it. But it is a serious moment for the country and it's generating a lot of, a lot of discussion. Uh, in terms of, because I had to give the background because that does shape what might happen in the future, I guess, as you could appreciate. What Joko Widodo wants to do is A, stamp out corruption or have a red hot go at it. And he has managed to do that in the, to some extent in the two cities that he's been there of or introduce uh, reforms or start measures to stop or slow down corruption. And he wants to improve health, education and infrastructure, which are all badly, uh, which all badly need improvement. But he's all, he also seems to be pro-business. He's a businessman himself. 
and he's mentioned several times how he will talk tough with business and particularly with foreign business which wants to come in and do more in Indonesia and has money ready to spend uh, but he wants to look after Indonesia's interests at the same time but he is a business fan and this is the, he has actually had to deal with bureaucracy red tape local politics you know trying to sell his product so he understands the everyday frustrations and to the business community the international business community he does represent to them their best hope of having an Indonesia that they can do business in in a clearer more straightforward way where they can actually um, take advantage of the, the, the demographic growth the number of people but also contribute more fully to the country and the, the share market has been reflecting that view for quite a while now but now everyone's a bit they're just they were holding off until October 20 and now they're like oh no we really don't know what's going on so business is watching to see if Jocko the, the key to getting the reforms through of course is to have Parliament on side so that he can get the agenda passed and this is why the, the makeup of the coalition and what happens next is so important um, He's a very calm man. He doesn't get ruffled at all. You know, he, he seems very determined in what he set out to do. He's very clear about it. And my understanding is that, you know, they, these remain his priorities. Corruption, helping people have proper health and education, building up infrastructure because it, it's badly needed. The country simply can't function efficiently without it. But also understanding that if Indonesia is to move ahead and grow, and reach the 7% target, which he has flagged, it is going to need money coming in from elsewhere. And that's what people hope he can do. The people who voted for him, that's what they want to happen in the next five years. Uh, will it happen? That is the question. And it will depend on all those factors that I've just uh, outlined. I think some of the, perhaps, indications are that uh, Jocko Widodo is a big fan of e-commerce, where all monetary transactions are done online. And this is his way of not just cutting out the middleman, but stopping yeah. the corruption. Yeah. You know, if the pot of money just isn't just sitting there, but it's all done electronically, and people can't actually physically have control over it, uh, or dictate, you know, that use, use their position, uh, to gain access to it, then that, that's sort of his very pragmatic way of trying to get around the problem of corruption. He wants to make the bureaucracy more efficient. And he started doing that. Um, he wants to give people better health care, and he started doing that. He introduced a, a health care card, which gave the very poorest um, faster access to hospitals and, and better medical care for the first time. Education is a huge issue for Indonesia. It needs much better education, and he wants to do that. And then there's the business community. They're watching and waiting to see, can he come through? And can he allow the, the foreign investment in and also create ease of business that the country needs? Um, so if he can do that, I think most analysts would say, yes, Indonesia is in a very, its future is looking good. 250 million people, a growing middle class, a country that is a democracy, I mean, I've, it's, probably one of the most robust democracies I've ever seen, that they will talk about anything, they're not afraid to throw up anything, and they value their democracy. They don't want it to change. And generally a friendly country, very open country. Uh, from a media perspective, it was very open. I was sometimes blown away. <laughs> so it has all that going for it, and that's what people want to build on. So it just depends. How far will Prabowo Subianto and his coalition push things? Where will it end up? Some have a very pessimistic view, some are optimistic. I, I would not give my thoughts on it because honestly I, I don't know and it could change every day. In fact, I think I used to say to my editor, this is the story today. There's a good chance it will change by tomorrow. <laughs>